Well, we are embarked on a study of the book of Revelation. And as I like to remind you, this book is the only book of the Bible that has the audacity to promise a special blessing to the reader or the hearer. And uh, no other book of the Bible has that presumption to say, read me, I'm special. All through the Bible, there's an admonition to read the Word of God, generically, collectively. But one book says, read me, I'm special, and that's the book of Revelation. And it's, just, it's a, a, a paradox that it is so neglected. Not only neglected, but many people shun it because of, well, a variety of reasons probably. But uh, one of the reasons is that these 404 verses that make up this book contain over 800 allusions from the Old Testament. So the reason it's strange to our ears, to many of us, is because we haven't done our homework in the Old Testament. And uh, one of the things I want to underscore as we go forward, I'm not here to sell you my views. I will tell you why I hold my views, but my passion is for you to study and discover for yourself. And uh, so we're here just to, what we hope you will gain from these studies is a respect and an awe of the integrity of design of these 66 books that we glibly call the Bible. Even though they were penned by over 40 different guys over several thousand years, they demonstrate an integrity of design that is astonishing the more you get into it. Every number, every detail, even the structures underneath the text evidence incredible craftsmanship, and more importantly, craftsmanship that had to have its origin from outside the dimensionality of time. You can prove it's extraterrestrial in its origin. And there's no other book that's probably more conspicuously uh, that way than the book of Revelation. So we'll, one of the things I'm hoping you will take away is the respect for the architecture and the integrity. Uh, in general, I'll try to present several different views and make no secret about the ones we hold. That, not that we're right, but just so you know where we're coming from. In this particular session, there's going to be some very interesting things emerge that you'll want to uh, take notes and come to your own conclusions about. Because we're in session 10, uh, and we're going to enter the throne room. We've, we've uh, had the outline. The, the book of Revelation has its own outline. It's the next to the last verse of the first chapter where John is instructed to write the things which you have seen. And by the time you get to this verse, what he's seen is a handful of verses that describe the physical appearance of Jesus Christ as He is today. And uh, from verse 12 on in chapter 1. So the things which he has seen is this vision of Christ that's now behind him. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, present tense. And th that will turn out to be chapters 2 and 3, the churches. And the things which shall be hereafter. The term ha is, uh, the, so the first chapter is the vision of Christ, chapter 1, first section. Then there's two chapters that, that uh, are made up of seven letters penned by Jesus Christ, in effect, uh, to seven churches. And we've just finished that section. That section is the most important section of the entire book because it's the one that we have that's addressed directly to us. But that's now behind us, and we're now going to go forward uh, in some astonishing um, avenues. And we're he says, now write the things which shall be metatauta after these things, what follows after the churches, in effect. And uh, it's this next section, this third section of the entire book that we're about to enter. And uh, the first verse of chapter 4 is after this, and the word there is metatauta, the same Greek word as occurred in verse 19. Metatauta, after this, or after these things. I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. After this, metatauta. And uh, the verse concludes with that same phrase, hereafter, after these things, metatauta. And uh, so our agenda tonight, then, is first of all to talk about a very strange, bizarre uh, point of view called the uh, harpazo. And this view is the most preposterous view in Christianity. The only thing it's got going for it is that it's unquestionably correct, in my view. And uh, we'll explore that because I want you to understand why it is that many conservative scholars, including ourselves, uh, 
believe that the harpazo occurs here at verse 1 of chapter 4 and, and, and following. So, we're then going to talk about the throne of God, glib phrase, but an astonishing opportunity to actually uh, visit the throne room of the entire universe. There's many of us that may have been treated to a corporate headquarters visit, one of the major corporations, or maybe we've visited the fourth basement at Omaha at one time, or NORAD, or, or uh, uh, command posts of different kinds, or Langley, Virginia, or Fort Meade, or whatever. Um, uh, we're going to enter a, a, a command post that pales all these others into insignificance, obviously. We're going to encounter a very strange group of people called the 24 elders. And unlike many of the other idioms we may encounter in the book, which we may look at and have different views, this will turn out to be a watershed issue. You'll want to satisfy yourself, don't accept my views, but to learn enough so that you can satisfy yourself as to who the 24 elders represent. We'll talk about the seven lamps that we saw in chapter 1 that represented the seven churches. We'll discover they're up there now. That's itself interesting. There's the sea of glass. We'll talk a little bit about that. Then we encounter these four strange creatures that are generally assumed to be cherubim. And I'm not going to split hairs of cherubim, seraphim. They're not probably the same thing, but for our purposes, they're some kind of super angels. And they have four faces. We're going to talk about those four faces. And then we encounter chapter 5, which, is, which has as the primary subject of chapter 5, a little short chapter. We're going to take it tonight too time permitting, uh, the seven sealed scroll. We're going to witness the ultimate escrow closing of the universe. And, uh, and we'll t that will also seal, I think, for us the identity of the 24 elders before it's over. But I want to emphasize something else. You know, we tend to think of these things as visions. All through the Bible, people see visions. I mean, aspects of those visions make them seem sort of surreal. This is quite different. Don't fall into the trap of assuming that these are just visions as such. Because as we emphasized in chapter 1, John was transported through time into the future and into a whole other domain, not a three-dimensional universe at all. You'll find these interesting, interesting expressions. He has prom the, the speaker says, I will show thee this, that, and the other thing. Seventy times John says, I looked and beheld and saw. He actually saw these things. He didn't hear about them. He wasn't uh, uh, writing supernaturally. He was recording what he saw. He says, I saw 35 times. I beheld. He says that seven times. I heard 23 times. In fact, if you study the sound passages, you'll discover they're loud. When they sing, they're loud. When someone talks to you, it's like a trumpet blowing in his ear. This is not the silent whisper that Elijah heard in the cave. This is, this is heavy duty stuff. But we're going to, we want to hit on, head on this whole issue of the harpazo. This does not mean you need to agree with this because it's a very controversial point of view. But I want you to understand why uh, we who, who uh, believe we're taking the Bible very strictly, very seriously, take this strange view seriously. Four times in Revelation the door is opened. And here's a voice as of a trumpet, and that seems to echo 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which is the famous rapture passage. Then he's, in, he's actually called, come, come up hither. And uh, we're discovering too, as you study your scripture, that heaven is a real, material place. It's not a state of mind. There's a fascinating article in the recent Scientific American in which scientists have discovered that the so-called constants of the universe, and one of the most... Uh, inviolable one is the what they call the fine structured constant. They're beginning to suspect they're not constant at all. In fact, in the words of the writer of the article, it's becoming clear that what our physical universe is a mere shadow of a larger reality. Now, scientists are discovering that was a great discovery. Anyone who knows their Bible says, "No kidding, Dick Tracy." See, <laughs> so heaven itself is not only a real material place; it's more real and more material than this virtual reality you and I. Uh, in. We're in a digital simulation uh, from, from the, uh, uh, the boundaries of a finite universe on the outside and a plasma physics, quantum physics um, uh, grid on the, on the small side. The veil. 
was torn, as we know from Luke 23 and elsewhere, and that's significant to open the way for us to go there. Now, this term rapture is the, is the term that's usually used for the herpazo, and of course, it's in the New Testament in many places. The two pivotal passages are 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. We're not going to go through the details there. It may surprise you that it appears to me at least, not to all scholars, but I believe that it occurs three times in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 26, at the end of that chapter, Zephaniah 2, 3, and Psalm 27, 5 seems to have a hint, just a hint, but an interesting one. And we cover all this in detail in a briefing package, so I'm not here to redo that briefing package. We don't have time for that, but I, th- I do want to hit some of the highlights of that. First of all, about the rapture, there's a promise of it in John 14. Jesus says, he opened upper, in the upper room discourse, He says, Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in Me. Do you believe in God? How many believe in God? That's the politically correct response from this audience. <laughs> Do you really, though? This is one of the things I'm going to predict is going to be challenged. You are going to be challenged. Not tonight, especially, hopefully, but uh, as you go forward. You need to know whether you really do and why you do, because uh, it's coming to some interesting crises. Now, we can say about Jesus Christ, He either was God or He wasn't God, and either knew that He was or didn't, or knew that He wasn't. Follow me? Well, If he wasn't God and didn't know he wasn't God, we would call that, what, a lunatic. If you feel that fits the description of what his achievements are, that's that's, uh, that's your choice. If he wasn't God and knew that he wasn't God, then he's a liar because he claimed to be. Well, he never claimed to be God. Then why did they crucify him? He was put to death because he claimed to be God. And uh, now, on the other hand, if he was God, he obviously knew he was. So the point is, he's either a lunatic, a liar, or Lord. There is no other possibility. As you examine the situation, he he has to fit in one of those three categories. And uh, you need to understand why it is that we really understand who he is and what he is all about. He continued that briefing with his disciples. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is one of the first hints in the New Testament of the rapture. And I want you to notice who it's all about. You. He's made a promise to you. Now to really understand a little more background, I should explain something. Most of us are products of what we'd call a Greek culture. And for us, prophecy is prediction and fulfillment prediction and fulfillment. That's a Greek model. That's not the Jewish model. In the Midrash model, prophecy is pattern. And we could do a whole hermeneutical study, an epistemological study on on the mindset, how a a Jewish perception of prophecy, he, he can see far more than we can because we're shackled to this prediction fulfillment model, which is which is true but limited. The Jewish model is much broader. Let me give you an example of that, and that's the Jewish wedding. Most of us, as Gentiles, have no real perception of what a Jewish wedding, especially the ancient Jewish wedding, was all about. There was the betrothal, the ketubah, where they, that was binding, a binding agreement. And uh, there was a payment of a purchase price for the bride. And she then was set apart, that is sanctified, is what the word sanctified means, set apart for her uh, bridegroom. And this is incidentally all through the Scripture. I won't take the time to develop it here. The bridegroom then would depart for his father's house where he would work to prepare an addition because typically that's the way they would get their start is living with the, with the fathers in father's home. And then the bride is to be on the ready for his return not knowing when it's going to be. And part of the game was he would surprise her show up when she wasn't expecting it and carry her away. That was part of the procedure. There, was, there would be a surprise gathering. And that's mentioned all through the Scripture. And uh, then you actually had the hoopah, the wedding, what we would think of the wedding proper. And uh, there would be a seven-day marriage supper. Now, do you begin to see a pattern here? When we start to talk about Jesus as the bridegroom, when we're going to talk later in the book of Revelation about the marriage supper of the Lamb, we'll get into some of this further. But see, the point, there's a couple of things I want to get into here. The marriage, 
See, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about the covenant being established. What was the purchase price? 1 Corinthians 6 deals with that. The bride is set apart. You and I are set apart. And we should be reminded continually of that covenant in 1 Corinthians 11, 25 through 26. The bridegroom has left for what? His father's house. That's where he is now. He's not on his own throne. He's on his father's throne. We're going to visit that in a minute. And uh, there'll be an escort to accompany him upon his return to gather his bride. He's coming back to gather his bride. Don't confuse that. There's two different comings. The second com- you see, speak of the second coming. He comes back twice. Once for his bride and once for Israel. So the process, 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about that. Job actually makes an allusion to this back in the oldest book of the Bible. I know that my Redeemer liveth, that he shall stand at that latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Paradoxical passage. Sounds like an oxymoron. The most astonishing declaration of the physical resurrection in the, in the Old Testament. But, and, but then again, back to First Thessalonians. Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. See, part of the problem was the Thessalonians had been taught by Paul for several weeks. He'd gone away. Some of their friends had died, and they were afraid they're somehow going to miss the act because they thought, the Lord's come back. What about the people who have died? And Paul's writing a letter to correct their understanding here that we're, we who are alive and we aren't going to encumber them. He goes on and says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, and oh yes, and the trump of God. Now, that's not the trumpet judgments we're going to encounter. Those are trumpet judgments. The trump of God occurs only twice in the Bible. Exodus 19, where the Mount Sinai incident occurred, and here. The trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He hasn't come to the earth. We're going to meet Him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This term that's translated caught up in the Greek is the verb harpazo. It means to be snatched forcibly and caught up. And uh, in the Latin, vulgate, it is, um, in Latin obviously, that word, rapamir, is, uh, is the word in the, in the Latin. And it's the proper tense of rapio, which is our English word rapt and raptures come from the past participle of the Latin verb rapatio. And there are seven raptures, technically, in the Scripture. Enoch was snatched. Elijah was snatched. Jesus is, is said to have been caught up in several places. Philip in Acts 8. These aren't necessarily supernatural resurrections, don't we say, but they're, ca- they're, they're, they're caught up. Paul is caught up. He speaks of it in 2 Corinthians 12. The whole body of Christ, of course, is in view in 1 Thessalonians 4. And John is in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. In fact, in those, the four, in, in the Revelation 12, 5, Acts 8, 39, and 2 Corinthians 12, 22 to 4, 1 Thessalonians, the actual verb there used is that Greek verb, harpazo. And uh, so, in Revelation 12, when we get there, we're going to discover that the woman there in Revelation 12, which is the summary of Israel, she brought forth a man child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up, the word is harpazo, to, unto God and unto His throne. Most people presume that that catching up is the ascension of Jesus Christ. That's a reasonable point of view. I believe it was G.H. Uh, uh, Pember was one of the first scholars to recognize that her child, that, that phrase may refer to the rapture because it is the body of Christ that is being, that's an idiom of the church, it's not just a figure of speech. It, we are His body, and it, it, may be, it may be an allusion to the, the, uh, the rapture there. The harpazo means to seize, catch up, or snatch away. Okay. Same word as we find in Thessalonians. Now why? What's the purpose of this strange episode? The church was started in a miracle. It's Acts chapter 2, uh, in, in the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost. It is born of a miracle. It'll be ended in a miracle. And uh, 
Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul deals with this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Was the resurrection, of body, the resurrection body of Jesus Christ a physical body? Absolutely. He says, handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bone. No blood. Okay, no blood. He shed his blood. No, fle flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Behold, I show you a mystery, Paul says. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. We'll leave that last trump discussion for Revelation chapter 8, because there's a lot of confusion about that one. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And by the way, this term, a twinkling of an eye, is not a wink. A wink's a very long period of time. What's the twinkling of an eye? I believe it's the time it takes light traveling at the speed of light, to travel through your lens. And that turns out to be about 10 to the minus 43 seconds. It's the smallest unit of time possible. There are no units of time shorter than that. You say that's impossible. That's quantum physics. I'll let you get into that another time. Okay. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now the physics of immortality. There's a lot of scientific studies lately on the physics of immortality. And Frank Tipler's book, uh, he's Mathematical Sciences in Tulane, an atheist, uh, that uh, made a study of this and came to the conclusion not only that God exists, but that all flesh is due for resurrection. He did that entirely from the physics of the atomic structure. Interesting enough. But there is a phrase in 1 John 3, 2 that I want to show you. And there's also a term in the New Testament called Oketerian that I think you want to be aware of. Now in 1 John 3, 2, there is a passage that many of us read. We may not, we may not realize it's a physics statement. John says, Beloved, we, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now, you, you say, what, what is that saying? When you and I as three-dimensional beings look at a photograph, we're looking at a two-dimensional representation, representation of a three-dimensional world, right? When we see Christ, he, may, he obviously has more than three dimensions because he can pass in and out of three-dimensional space at will, even though he's a material. You and I, unless you have some hyperspace background, that doesn't sound understandable, but... but that's, that's, that's understood to mathematicians that, and physicists that study this. The point is, we know from a number of cases that he has a, more dimensions than three. What this is saying is we're not going to be seeing a three-dimensional representation of a ten-dimensional being or whatever. We're going to be, whatever dimensionality he enjoys, we'll enjoy. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So whatever dimensionality he enjoys is going to be our inheritance. And that's staggering. That's awesome. Um, we'll move on. In, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, there's another phrase Paul uses. He says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, our bodies, be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, and it goes on. Now there's a word in here that's translated house. It's in the Greek word, it's okaterian, and it only occurs twice in the New Testament. And it's, I think, a much more technical term than just speaking of a house or a habitat. It, uh, it only appears here and in Jude 6. And in Jude 6 it has to do with something quite sinister. The angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, hath he reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. And this is an allusion to Genesis chapter 6 and the strange goings on in chapter 6. But the point is, this term for first estate again is the same, is, it was archaic, is a principality, it's, it's, the, it, it's the place, the domain of the angels and demons. And uh, this, when they left their own habitation, they left their Oketarian. Apparently, what they left is what we aspire to. There's a reality, a body, 
uh, a domain that we aspire to. For this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. That's the same word. And uh, we'll move on here. Je- the Jewish wedding. Uh, we talked about the betrothal, the payment of the purchase price. The bride is set apart. The bridegroom departs to his father's house, prepares a room addition. The bride prepares for an eminent return. The key word I want to come back to. We also have another concept. You don't have to agree with this. There's some that don't, but I want you to understand there is a thing called the doctrine of eminence. And uh, eminent here means the next expectation. Don't confuse this term with the word eminent, which means, spelled differently, that God is not only transcendent far above us, but He's always with us. That's another, he, He's eminent since He's available to us. Different word. And it's not, should, shouldn't be confused with eminent with an E, which is a title of honor. So, so it's an eminent person, meaning He's very, very eminent. The word we're dealing here is spelled differently. It means something quite different. It means, eminent means it's the next thing that could happen. Nothing need intervene between here and there. Believers are taught to expect the Savior from heaven at any moment. That's what we call the doctrine of eminency. You'll find it in Philippians 3.20, Titus 2.13, Hebrews 9.28, and on and on and on, all through the New Testament. It expresses the hope and the warm spirit of expectancy. You and I are instructed all through the Gospels and all through the Epistles to expect Christ at any moment. Some of you are hoping He'll come before this meeting, this dreary meeting is over with. Okay. Whatever. And this expectancy should result in a very purified and very victorious life. To live in such a way that your your boss is going to show up at any moment. Clearly that's what he instructed. There are doctrines prevalent in many churches that say this, that, and the other thing have to happen first. To hold those views you have to deny the doctrine of eminency. And that's going to be very important as we get into some of these issues. Paul seemed to include himself among those who looked for Christ's return. He didn't necessarily expect to die. In several of his letters, 1 uh, Thessalonians 4 and 2 Thessalonians 2, he makes those allusions. Timothy, his protege, was admonished to keep his commandment without spot, un- unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, there again he was instructed that way. And Jewish converts were reminded that yet a little while and he that shall come will come and he will not tarry. That's in Hebrews 10.37. In fact, this became such a problem in the early church that many people gave up working. They didn't send their kids off to college or whatever. The expectation was so strong that they stopped work and had to be exhorted to return to their jobs in 2 Thessalonians 3 and to have patience in James 5.8 and so on. So I want you to be aware of that. Now, if you start collecting passages of the second coming of Jesus Christ, you'll, you'll obviously find more than a couple of dozen passages that talk about the second coming. But as you study those, you'll discover, as you collect these, they'll start to fall into two buckets that are opposites. There's a group of them that I'm going to call the second coming in the sense that Jesus is coming in power to take over the earth. There's also a group Oh, and the first group, by the way, every eye shall see him, it's a big deal. No one will miss that. There's another group of passages, about the same number of them, roughly take 20 some odd, that talk about a coming that comes in secret. And he doesn't come to the earth, he meets his own in the air. It's, you discover they're really quite different. Now we don't have time to go through each one and contrast them. What we'll do is just lump them together. There's a group of these that talk, the one group, the, tra- the believers are translated into the resurrection bodies. The other one doesn't have a translation mentioned at all. In one case, the translated saints go to heaven. In the other case, the translated saints return to the earth from heaven. They're different. In one case, the earth isn't judged. In the other one, it is judged. In one case, it's, it comes at, eminent, at any moment. In the second coming, there are all kinds of signs that have to precede it. Not the least of which is for Israel to petition Him to come back. Hosea 5.15 and elsewhere. The rapture is not in the Old Testament explicitly. The second coming is all through the Old Testament. The rapture is believers only and the second coming affects all men on the earth. The rapture occurs before the day of wrath as we learned in the seven letters seven churches. second coming concludes the day of wrath. They almost bound it in a sense of speaking. Rapture has no reference to Satan. Of course, second coming Satan is bound. In the rapture He comes for His own. Second coming He comes with His own. 
The rapture he comes in the air. The second, he, in the second coming he comes to the earth. The rapture he claims his bride. And the second coming he comes with his bride. The rapture only his, only his own will see him. In the second coming every eye shall see him. You know, it's interesting, while he was on the earth after his crucifixion, he was only seen by loving eyes and he was only handled by loving hands. That will not be the case when he comes in the second coming. He'll come for vengeance. Rapture, the great, tri great, great tribulation will begin afterwards. The second coming, the millennium begins. The rapture apparently involves only uh, church believers only. And the uh, second coming, the Old Testament saints, in the minds of many scholars, not necessarily every, all agree, will be raised later, after the second, later on. So the marriage is fulfilled. The covenant was established, 1 Corinthians 11. The purchase price, 1 Corinthians 6. The bride was set apart. And all through the, the uh, epistles we find that. And they're reminded of the covenant. The bridegroom left for the father's house. And there will be an escort to accompany him when he comes to gather his bride. So the pattern would seem to be fulfilled. Well, enough of this background. But with that perception, be it right or wrong, that's one of the reasons we see John in verse 1 uh, in effect, acting. Uh, in verse 2 of Revelation uh, 4, he says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. Now let's talk a little bit about thrones. There's a lot of confusion about different thrones here. The word throne appears 58 times in the New Testament, 43 times just in this book, and 14 in this chapter. So this is the throne room chapter of the book. Now the Messiah will sit on his father's throne, according to Psalm 110. And we also, he also mentioned that in uh, the letter seven churches, when he sits on his father's throne. That's not a new idea to us. We also know he's going to sit on the throne of his mercy. Hebrews 4.16 makes a reference to this. There's some of us that suspect that the mercy seat that stood on top of the Ark of the Covenant, not the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, will be that throne from which he rules at Mount Zion. But that's a whole other study I encourage you to explore. It's speculative, but rather interesting. But we know that the Messiah will sit on the throne of David. Don't confuse that with the throne of his father. That's promised in Isaiah 9, but it also Gabriel pr promised that to Mary in Luke chapter 1, that her child that was born would sit on the throne of David. Now, why is that important? The throne of David did not exist during his early min earthly ministry. Rome ruled the place. There was no David's throne. Will he? Yes, he will. That means the thr throne is going to be reestablished. Now, the twelve apostles are also going to sit on thrones. We're going to sit on twelve thrones and judge the twelve tribes. And also, don't, know ye not that you will judge angels, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6 and so forth. We're also going to find there's 24 elders that sit on thrones. In your King James Version, it says seats, but it's the same I I Greek word. Uh, sit on thrones. We're going, to, we're going to take a great interest in those 24 elders. Now, don't confuse all of this with the unbelievers being judged at what's called the great white throne, which will occur in Revelation 20, much, much later. Are we together? There's different thrones. Okay. Now, so he sees these thrones. He says, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Notice he's talking about the person on the throne. And he's dealing with it. I tend to suspect that these gems are used as an ancient way of referring to colored light. But that's just a, a conjecture on my part. In any case, a jasper was clear as crystal. There are many scholars who believe it was an ancient term for what you and I would call a diamond. Diamond. The sardian stone was red. Remember sardius and all that? We went through the, the, red, the blood red stone. Now, um, the word rainbow is misleading. You and I think of a rainbow as having all these different colors. The word in the Greek is iris. It also can mean halo. It isn't a rainbow like a spectrum necessarily. It's a halo of some kind. But uh, more importantly, as you know from your study of the Old Testament, and we'll get into this more when we get to the New Jerusalem, there were 12 stones that defined the 12 tribes in effect. And the first of those, and the last of those, were, were of the stones of the high priest, were the Sardius, was the, which represented the Ru, what Reuben, who was the firstborn of the 12, right? And uh, the word meant, behold a son. The twelfth one was a jasper for Benjamin, the last of the bunch of the twelve. And that Benjamin means the son of my right hand. 
So here between the first and the twelfth, between these stones, you have the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Behold the Son, the Son of my right hand. Again, you have them all embraced. The main point is the twelve, these first and last embrace the twelve. And so between the beginning and the end, you have the whole, the whole enchilada, so to speak. Okay, moving to verse 4. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Or, and upon these seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Well, the first point is the word there in the Greek is thronos. It can mean seats, but it assumes the seats have been assigned to kings or judges or some. In other words, there, the term throne, it it's surprising why the translators didn't put throne there because it's the same word. In any case, they're sitting on thrones, they're clothed in white raiment, that's a clue, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So we know three things about these elders so far. We're going to want to understand these elders for lots of reasons. But they had crowns of gold. Now, one thing, the only place you'll find 24 in the Bible is when David organizes the Levitical priests. He organizes them into 24 courses. And each, there, there's about 24,000 in total, by the way, people that are involved here. But 24 courses. And each course uh, served for one week, they changed it Shabbat. And so they would get twice a year, they would be on duty. And they would rotate. Certain holidays, they were all involved. But the point is, that was the basic pattern. David's 24 courses. What the 24 seem to rep seems to represent is the 24 leaders represented the whole collection. So when those 24 were together, they represented the whole priesthood. Follow me? Okay. Now, it may surprise you to realize there were priests in the Bible that were not Levitical before Levi was, all that was established. Do you remember Jethro, Moses' father-in-law? He was a priest. He was a priest of Midian. What kind of priest was he? I don't know. He wasn't a Levitical priest for sure, because that, you know, didn't fit. You follow me? But there was a priest. Remember, Jacob gave tithes in Genesis 28. To whom? We don't know. To some priest. But perhaps the strangest one, and the one that is important of all these, is Melchizedek. In Genesis 14, we discover this strange character so shows up that's a king and a priest. He's unique in that regard. In fact, he would disappear in obscurity himself if it wasn't for Psalm 110 and the writer of the book of Hebrews. Psalm 110 points out that the Messiah, when he comes, will be after the order, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the writer to Hebrews spends three chapters amplifying what that means. That the Levitical priesthood was a temporary one that would have an end. This was a permanent one. One that would really deal with the, the, the things that the Levitical could only deal in symbols and so forth. So there's a big messianic issue here. Now getting back to these 24 elders, they represent a completed group of some kinds. There are some things they can't be. Now there are many people that study prophecy that are convinced that these, uh, that these elders are a collection of angels. Or some say uh, tribulation believers. Some think that they're the tribulation believers, except uh, uh, that's going to be refuted in Revelation 7.13. Because when you get to chapter 7, one of the elders answered, saying to me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Whence came they? And he said, Sir, you know. Thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. When you get to chapter 7, that's a distinct group. That's not the 24 elders. So that, that's, what they can't, that's what they're not. One of the elders, in fact, is explaining to John what's going on here. So they're not tribulation believers. They can't be angels. Revelation 7.11 has a... All the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. And it goes on. How many of the angels stood about the throne? All of them. And they also stood about the elders. See, this tells you clearly that the elders are not angels. Do you follow me? Follow the logic? Okay. All the angels. Not half of them, most of them. So they can't, the elders can't be the angels. They can't be the nation Israel, as you'll discover in chapter 7 and 12 and so forth. What are the elders' distinguishing characteristics? Well, first of all, they're sitting on thrones. That's a clue. They are clothed in white raiment. That's another clue. Both these are allusions that come from the seven letter seven churches, you may recall, from chapter 3 in the, in the letter to Laodicea. 
They're wearing crowns of gold. That's referred to twice in the letter of seven churches. The most convincing uh, spike on this argument is the song that they sing, which will occur in chapter 5. But first of all, notice they're called elders and they're called kings and priests. Now remember, we have crowns, let's get back to these crowns for a minute. We have crowns promised. Remember the crown of life? We saw that in Revelation 2. The crown of righteousness uh, for those who loved His appearing. The crown of life for those who have suffered for His sake. The crown of glory for those who fed the flock. The crown of incorruptible, 1 Corinthians 9. And the crown of rejoicing for those who win souls. These are five classic crowns named in the Scripture that uh, are, are alluded to and, and always, and always uh, uh, re referred to. I just think these happen to be five named. I think there's lots of other ones. But these are specific crowns. You, can, you can't earn your salvation, but you can earn your crowns. The difference between uh, salvation and rewards. These are the category of rewards. Well, let's move on. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Well, now that's an interesting phrase. Seven lamps of fire. We were introduced to those seven lampstands in chapter 1. And Jesus Himself explained those images to you at the end of chapter 1. He said, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are what? The seven churches. They were there on the earth in chapter 1. They are in heaven in chapter 4. That's kind of interesting. I wouldn't build a doctrine on that. I should just point out to you that's interesting. And so... And before the throne was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. I love this because I think the Holy Spirit deals in puns. Because in the tabernacle, what you saw after you got past the brazen altar, you saw the laver the bowl of water where you washed in it, right? Before you could go into the holy place. Ephesians talk about we're, we're, we're clean because you're washed in the water by the Word, right? So it's the Word of God. And you wash in it in the tabernacle. Here in heaven, you don't, you don't need any washing anymore. You're standing on it. See, in either case, it's the Word of God. In one case, we wash in it. Here, they're standing on it. The sea of glass, I believe, is idiomatic of that. I think there's a really sea of glass. Don't misunderstand me. But I, I, think, I think the symbolism is fact. I think the Holy Spirit deals in puns. It's like in a crystal. In the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts. And that's an unfortunate translation. The word beast is it's actually a different... Therion is, is the beast, the voracious beast. This is a zoa, the same word in Greek from which we get zoo. They are living creatures. There were four living creatures full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast, or living creature, was like a lion. And the second beast like a calf. And the third one like a, had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. I find this fascinating. And so you have to bear with me as we get into this a little bit. And the four beasts each had uh, six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Why is it always holy, holy, holy? In, 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 in Isaiah 6, Isaiah is treated to a vision of the throne of God. And he sees the same thing, essentially. And it's always holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Why holy, holy, holy? A trinity. A trinity. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Let's talk about these four faces that are before the throne of God. We find them in Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1 and 10. We find them in the four Gospels in a strange way. They're hidden there, really. And then I want to show you something from Numbers 2. I'm going to squeeze this all in. Bear with me. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is treated this fabulous thing. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims. He calls them seraphims. Some scholars think the seraphims and cherubims are slightly different. They are a little different, apparently. Some think they're just fancy words for something we don't fully understand anyway. But they're certainly super angels of some kind. Whether there's two different kinds or not, who knows. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of His glory. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, a fire enfolding itself, and Bright, this, excuse me, I'll shift to Ezekiel chapter 1, similar situation. Brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, and, also, and out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. 
And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Every one had four faces. Every one had four wings. Now there are some differences you'll notice, but there's also some interesting similarities. Everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub in this case, and the second the face of a man, the third the face of a lion, the fourth the face of an eagle. In the other case uh, it was an ox, and here's a cherub. There's a little difference there, interestingly. When you look at the four Gospels, this is by way of review, you know that Matthew, being a Jew, presents Jesus Christ as the Mashiach Nagi, the, the Messiah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And as such, he starts his genealogy of Abraham, the first Jew. Mark presents Jesus Christ as the suffering servant, and you're not interested in this pedigree of a servant, so Mark's the one of the three that has no genealogy. Luke, being a Gentile and a doctor, he presents Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. And in that spirit of his emphasis, he starts his genealogy with Adam, the first man, and gives you the bloodline of Jesus Christ, where Matthew gives you the legal line. John has a genealogy most people don't recognize. It's the genealogy of the pre-existent one, the first three verses of his gospel. He presents Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and he speaks of his eternal pre-existence. And each of the gospels is designed around that central theme. Matthew emphasized what Jesus said. Mark, what Jesus did. Luke, what Jesus felt. And John, who he was. Matthew writes to the Jew, Mark the Roman, Luke the Greek, John the church. The first miracle appropriate to that, Matthew, like a, a, a very Jewish thing, had a leper cleansed. Both Mark and Luke, in Gentile orientation, had a demon expelled. John goes mystical, water turns to wine. The, the ending of the Gospels, Matthew ends as a Jewish woodwit with the resurrection, Mark with the ascension. Luke sets up his sequel. He, he speaks of the promise of the Holy Spirit, which sets up Luke volume 2, which is the book of Acts. And John speaks of the promise of his return, which of course sets up his sequel, which is the book of Revelation. Interesting how these tie together, isn't it? Now it's interesting that the camp of Israel, when you get to Numbers 2 you'll discover, and I'll get to that in a minute, that the twelve tribes camped in, uh, encamped in four camps, three tribes in each camp. And uh, the, 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 tri the tribe of Judah, well, let's, uh, let's go through this. The ensign for the east side was Judah and two tribes, and uh, his ensign was the lion. On the west side, that was on the east, on the west side was Ephraim with the ox and two other tribes, and then Luke had Reuben the man and John the eagle. These were, all twelve tribes had ensigns, but these four were the key ones for the camps. A lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. Does sound familiar? I thought we just went, okay. I want to show you something. I have this strange idea that there's nothing in the Bible that's by accident. That every number, every place name, every detail is there by skillful engineering. And that's an interesting challenge to, to find that. In Numbers, you say, okay Chuck, let's look at Numbers 2. You say every detail is by design? Yes. What possibly could be hidden? What detail could be hidden behind the camp of Israel? Jesus said, the volume of the book is written of me. So somehow this is not only going to be meaningful, it's going to speak of Jesus Christ. Now when you go through the numbering in Numbers 2, you'll discover you have the numbers of each of the tribes. And I won't go through the numbers here, save to say these are just extracted from the text. Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun are a group. And you go through, what, what do these numbers tell you? Well, nothing so far, except we do know from Numbers 2 that they cluster in four camps. And the camp of Judah, not the tribe of Judah, the camp of Judah, which includes Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, adds up to 186,400. And Reuben, the camp of Reuben, adds up to 151. Ephraim, 108 and some. And Dan, 150 and odd. Say, gee, Chuck, that's what, what am I going to do with that information? Well, let's take a look at the camp of Israel. In the center of the camp was the tabernacle. No surprise. And the tabernacle was oriented so that uh, on the eastern side was the one gate and so forth. And you, you should study the tabernacle because every detail, every dimension, every material speaks of Jesus Christ. The Levites themselves camped around the tabernacle. And I don't know how many there were there, and I don't know much, how much space they took. But whatever their space was, that's going to be our unit of measure for you'll see. Whatever it was. Because they're the Levites. Okay. Now understand the instructions. The camp, the Judah had to camp east of the Levites. Okay. The camp of Reuben, south of the Levites. That's what the scripture says. Underst yes, think like a rabbi. They tried very hard to obey what they regard as the law. So if they're going to be strictly obedient to this, there's a space they cannot camp. And that's southeast. Because it's neither south nor east, you follow me? 
I'll show you in the diagram. Only cardinal directions are ordained, and only the width of the camps allowed, and the length will then be proportional to the population. In other words, if we have the Levites, Judah would camp on the eastern side, their symbol was the lion, they could camp as wide as the Levites did, but no wider, because then they're no longer east. Follow me? But they'll take as much space as they need. Now, Reuben, his symbol was the man, and they camped on the south side, and they could only camp as wide as the Levites, or they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be south anymore. There's an area here you can't camp because it's southeast. It's, not, it's prohibited. So you go ahead and finish this out with Ephraim up on the uh, west side, who's an ox. And you have Dan here, who originally was the serpent, but uh, he's changed it to an eagle with a serpent in its mouth, and it becomes a symbol of Dan. There's a whole thing there I'll, up for another day. But the point is, okay, here we are, and let's put the numbers in. This one, they're going to be as long as the proportion of their population. The numbers are the number of men they're able to go to war. Okay. Um, add to that a wife, maybe a kid. There's a multiple, 2.3, 2.5, something, to get the actual population. We don't care. The, it's proportions we're interested in. There's 186 there, 108 there. And when you lay it out, if you go over the fly, if you fly over the camp of Israel while it's in the wilderness, what do you see? In, what do you see? You said that, I didn't. <laughs> now, I think that's fascinating. There is an aerial sketch of the camp of Israel tucked away in the Torah. And like all of these things, they're not only curious, they always point to Jesus Christ. And interestingly enough, the, um, the uh, model with J God dwelling in the center, that's what the tabernacle was all about, uh, is surrounded again by the ox, the man, the eagle, and the lion, as we see in the throne of God. Probably unknown to them, maybe they did understand, they were modeling the throne of God as they traveled. Interestingly enough. So that's a little side piece. Let's move on. Chapter 4, verse 9. When the beast gave glory and honor to the thanks to him to sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fell down before him and sat, that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And if we had the time, we'd sing that. Many of you sing that in church as a song, and uh, it's right here from in verse 11. But now we get chapter 5. Bear with me. We're, this, is the, this is awesome. Chapter 5, verse 1, John says, I saw on the right hand of him, of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Now, understand, you and I, when we hear a book, we think of a codex. That's thing with pages. Uh, that's second century onward. Uh, codexes were just beginning to make an appearance. What a book to them was a scroll, okay? I'll give you a little background. They're typically out of papyrus. They were papyrus bush about 15 feet high, 6 feet underwater, about as thick as a man's wrist. The pith was e extracted and cut into thin strips with a sharp knife, and then rows were laid out vertically and then horizontally, moistened with water and glue, pressed together, beaten with a mallet, and smoothed to make paper, what, you, uh, uh, what we would consider uh, 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 an anticipatory type of paper. The front side was a smooth side with a horizontal grain. That's where writing was normally done. The back side went the wrong way and was very rough. It's called the verso. Uh, that's with vertical grain on the back side. A, she a sheet that was written on the back was called an epistograph, which means written behind. It was unusual because it was a very rough surface. Okay. Now these things are cut and put into rolls. But the outside was coarse, so you normally didn't write on it. If there was writing on the outside, there were instructions about its opening. It wasn't normal data. You follow me? Okay. Eight by ten sheets, typically joined horizontally, written in narrow three-inch columns, roughly, two and a half inch top and bottom margins, three quarters. That's what, that's what it looked like we had when laying out here. I meant to throw some pictures in, but I ran out of time. And it rolled on a wooden roller. Jude, 2nd, 3rd John, Philemon are just one sheet each. They're short little books. Romans is about 11 and a half feet long. Mark is about 19 feet long. Gospel of John, 23 and a half feet long. Matthew is about 30 feet long. He took shorthand. All the discourses are there in, in, uh, in, in verbatim. Luke and Acts, 32 feet each. Revelation, about 15 feet. And so, uh, now, there is an application that's tucked away in Jeremiah I want to brief you on. Jeremiah is facing the Babylonian captivity. He knows that his nation is about to go into slavery for 70 years. 
Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, in other words, he's the son of the uncle, he's a nephew, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison. He's in prison, by the way, see? And, uh, and, and uh, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew this, this was the word of the Lord. Now wait a minute. Why should Jeremiah buy this field? He's, there's 70 years captivity. He's not going to survive the captivity. What does he want to buy a field for? Well, because the Lord told him. Let's go on here. So I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed for him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. I subscribed the evidence and sealed it, and took witnesses, and weighed him the money and the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And I gave evidence of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Ner, uh, the son of uh, Messiah, and the, in the sight of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. And I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. So they take this thing and they bury it. Now, you, that's all that's said about it. There's some more talk about it, but the point is, emotionally, this was a commitment. This was God's way of telling them that they're, they're going to have a remnant return. They're going to captivity for 70 years. But they're not going to be like the northern neighbors that got wiped out, the Assyrians, when they took the northern kingdom. They're going to, be, they're going to come back with integrity as a nation 70 years. And they, and they were. Now, you have to visualize what happened when they came back. Somebody would dig up that jar, pull out these sealed documents, and if they could comply with the requirements written on the outside, they could unseal it and take title to that land that was purchased for them. Get the picture? So this is a model I want you to be aware of as we go forward here. Revelation chapter, two verse, uh, chapter 5 verse 2, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book? and to loose the seals thereof. There is a scroll in the right hand of God, and it's sealed. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Then it says a strange thing. No man in heaven or in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. This is strange. It had to be a man. It had to be a kinsman of Adam. Somehow this is related to Adam. I submit to you, it's our understanding that this is a title deed to the earth that Adam forfeit, that Jesus purchased, and he's going to take title to what he purchased. Anyway, no man in heaven or in earth, neither under the earth. Those are three places they searched for somebody. Let you think about that a while. And he looked around. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither look thereon. The Greek says, John says, sobbed convulsively. You and I don't understand what's going on, but John did. And this was the most, uh, the worst tragedy he could imagine that no man was found worthy. Now, to really understand what's going on here, you need to look, you have to understand the book of Ruth. You're, that was your reading assignment for this session anyway. So Boaz there is the hero. He's the Goel. He turns out to be the kinsman redeemer. And by his act of redemption, Naomi gets her land back, and she's a type of Israel. And by the law of Leverite marriage that he simultaneously executes, he takes a Gentile bride, Ruth. And uh, there's a little four-chapter book, and we've gone, probably been through it a hundred times, but each time we go through we make a new discovery. There is more treasures tucked away in this little tiny book once you understand what's really going on there. And uh, the redemption is sealed, and we could go through all of that. But the net of it is, our kinsman redeemer is, of course, Jesus Christ. He's our Goel. And to be a Goel, you had to do four things. You had to be a kinsman. Jesus had to be a kinsman of Adam. Unless he was a kinsman, he couldn't redeem. He had to be able to do it, which also means he had to be sinless in this case. He had to be able. That still isn't enough. He had to be willing. Still his choice. Boaz did not have to take Ruth. He chose to. He also had to, assume, in order to be a goal, he had to assume all the obligations of the beneficiary. And these four conditions, of course, 
Boaz complied with in the book of Ruth, these four conditions Jesus Christ complied with on your behalf as well as mine. One of the elders said unto me, Weep not, he's talking to John, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. John says, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four beasts, and the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. We're not talking about a lion, we're talking about a lamb as it had been slain, having seven heads and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth through all the earth. Who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ. Strange descriptors maybe in your eyes. You know, I want you to notice something. All through the book of Revelation, we've had titles of Jesus Christ. We've had all kinds of titles in chapter 1, 24 of them. Those 24 were used in various ways through the uh, first three chapters. Chapters 2 and 3 used all, each, each letter used a different title of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice something. None of those titles were Jewish. From here on, all the titles of Christ will be Jewish. Very strange. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's Jewish. The uh, Root of David. Jewish. The Lamb. The Passover. When John the Baptist first introduces Jesus Christ publicly, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a title that uh, he introduced him publicly for the first time. So there's a very strange uh, uh, thing going on here. The Lion and the Lamb. The Lamb speaks of His first coming. The Lion speaks of His second coming. And uh, the, they're very different. They're so different, it's one of the reasons the rabbis didn't recognize them when He came. Now these seven horns is kind of a strange term for us, but see, horns are a traditional symbol of power and honor all through the Scripture. We find that a uh, very prominent prophetic idiom. Seven eyes refer to the seven spirits of God, introduced in Zechariah 3 and 4. And of course, He reigns from Mount Zion, and according to Psalm 2, and so forth. Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus the Messiah. The Lion comes from Jacob's final blessing on his sons, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10. He's also the Root of David, the Lion of David, and all, that's all through both the Old and New Testament. He was the result of David's line. He was a descendant of David, yet He created David. And that paradox is something Jesus used to confuse the Pharisees. Okay? And uh, they couldn't unravel that because they didn't, they, didn't, they, they didn't get it. But uh, he made a point of that in Matthew 22. You can check it out. Now, in, Ge in God's covenant with David, his line was to rule not just over Israel, over the whole earth. 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 2, verse 8, and elsewhere. You understand? We need to understand that most churches today have no grasp that Jesus is Jewish, and that He's going to take a throne on the earth and rule the earth through Israel. There's over 1,800 references of that in the Scripture. It was confirmed to Mary at the announcement in Luke 1. But I want to show you something else that's kind of fun. Pilate, when Jesus is crucified, now this is the, this is the personal representative of the ruler of the world. He's going to label what's going on here. Mel Gibson didn't. Pilate did. Okay? And he could read, interesting, he could write in three languages. That impressed me about Pilate. Pilate wrote the title, the title, um, and put it on the cross. The writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus crucified was nigh unto the city, and it was written in Hebrew and in Greek and Latin. Hebrew, because that's the language of the area. Greek, because that was the commercial language throughout the world. And Latin, because that was the official language of the Roman Empire. Later, you know, later to rise to prominence. Pilate personally wrote all three languages. That's it. But he's doing something here in Hebrew that I think is really funny. He is putting the needle in these Pharisees. Anytime you and I as Gentiles miss a point, the Pharisees come to our rescue. Whenever they're upset, that's the way the Holy Spirit underlines what's going on here. Because the next verse, then said the chief priest of the, of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. They wanted it rephrased slightly. We, in the English, you miss the point. But Pilate didn't miss the point. He says, what I have written, I have written. I always vi visualize Ewell Brenner. So let it be written, so let it be done, you know. <laughs> Pilate's epitaph. This is what he wrote. Remember, it goes, all languages go uh, towards Jerusalem. Nations east of Jerusalem go from right to left. Nations west of Jerusalem go from left to right. But okay. 
So that's, that's what it looks like in Hebrew. And again, reading the first word on the right side is Yeshua, Hanatzerai, the Melech, Yehudim, Jesus the Nazareth, of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now what you and I miss, but to see that Jews are always into acrostics and encryptions. Okay, what's an acrostic? The first letter of each word. That's Psalm 119. Each part of that is, starts with the first, first letter, then the second letter. It's, it, the whole thing's an acrostic. There's a lot of psalms that are acrostics and so forth. Well, what is this acrostic? Well, it turns out if you take the first letter of each of those four words, you spell Yahweh Vavhe, the unpronounceable name of God. Pilate is implying not only is Jesus Christ the King of the Jews, he is Yehovah or Yahweh or however you want to pronounce the unpronounceable name. Now, does that mean he really believed he was God? I wouldn't go that far necessarily. But you, he knew that would upset these people that had put him in the predicament he was in. He knew they had delivered him up for envy. And that was his way, if nothing else, putting the needle in. But I'll tell you something else. As you read the Scripture, you also discover when the empty tomb was emptied, he was not surprised. When they asked for a guard, he says, make, you have your guard. Make it as sure as you can. You can hear his cynicism. He was not, I don't believe he was surprised when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Anyway, move on. Revelation, back to Revelation 5. And he came and took the book. Jesus came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four twenty elders uh, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals there, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us. To, these are the twenty-four elders singing. Have done, have redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. I want you to notice it's us and we. The, the 24 elders are singing, this is their words. These are their, their words. Thou art worthy, Jesus, to take the book to open the seals there, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us, the 24 elders to God by thy blood out of every kindred tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto God, our uh, God, kings and priests, key word. There are only three people that are kings and priests, Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, and us. Isn't that wild? The church. Made us unto God, our kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's the 24 elders. Now, why is this so important? Because the 24 elders are there before he gets the book. They're there they celebrate when he receives the book. When he starts opening those seals, starts the wrath of God on the earth. The time is called the Great Tribulation. The tribulation can't start until the seals are broken. The seals can't be broken until the Lamb receives the book. The Lamb can't receive the book until the 24 elders have already cast their crowns in the glassy sea. Yes, there's going to be persecution. We may suffer that here in America. Where do we get the arrogance to presume that we're going to be exempt from what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the last 1900 years have had to endure? It's called persecution. But this period called the Great Tribulation is something we will watch from the mezzanine. There are lots of reasons I hold that view, but this comes as close to a certain proof as I can come to. Don't accept it because of that reason. Do your own study, come to your own conclusions, but at least you understand where we're coming from. Unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. And uh, <laughs> there are some churches, getting back to this previous thing, where he says, uh, uh, Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. There are some churches that remove that from their hymns when they sing this as a hymn. They remove that. And J. <laughs> J. Vernon McGee made an interesting crack. He said, maybe God doesn't want them in heaven because they might be embarrassed to have to sing about his blood. <laughs> <laughs> Typical J. Vernon. <laughs> anyway, him that loved us and washed us from, his, uh, from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests, there it is again, unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We are kings and priests if we're in the, 20, if we're the 24 elders group. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Wow! wonder what he left out. There are seven possessions. There are power. 
Because we're not talking about someone who can dream and never realize. We're talking about someone that's able. There are lots of verses on that, of course. Someone who has riches. There's no claim on him which he cannot satisfy. There's no promise that he cannot carry out. What makes the God of Abram, Isaac, and Yaakov distinct from the God of Allah is that one is capricious, doesn't keep his promises. The other one delights in making and keeping his promises. That's the God we serve. He's trustworthy. And he finds a different way every day to ask you, do you trust me? God will find different ways to ask you that question. He's the one, he also being praised for wisdom, both secrets and practical knowledge, in both senses of that, that word. And he's, he's got a strength that can disarm all the powers of evil and overthrow Satan. The good news is, as I watch world events, and I get upset, even with those that I would normally back in our country, I get so upset with things I see going on, I have to con constantly remind myself that we're pilgrims. That this is Satan's world. Even at its best, it's Satan's world. And that's uh, disturbing. But God, we, 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 the, the, the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Honor is, uh, he's the one for, before whom every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord indeed. And the glory which is his alone and the blessing which is the inevitable climax of it all. He pours all of this on us. You and me, personally. Awesome. And then we wrap it up. And every, every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I say, Blessed and uh, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the people said, Amen. There you go. And the four twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. Whew. Now as you can probably tell, there are so many concepts here that we could, we can take off on but I'm assuming a fairly mature group, when we, we use a lot of these terms, you're familiar, and there's enough verses in the notes that you can take off and, and do the study. In the coming sessions now, there are four things that are out of place. The first was out of place, that was the church, but it's now in heaven. The nation Israel is supposed to be in the land, it's not yet. It's very tenuous, the hold they have is pretty tenuous. The devil ought to be in the lake of fire, he's going to have He's going to be bound for a while, but we'll see how that goes. All that. And then Christ is supposed to be on His own throne. He's now on His Father's throne. These four things are out of place. So now, from this point on, the fireworks begin. And uh, chapters 6, the next chapter, through 19, detail the most documented period of time in, in the Bible. Both the Old and the New Testament detail a seven-year period of time with all kinds of insights. And chapters 6 through 19 are a detailing of that particular period of time. Uh, very traumatic events, but they're the most documented in the Bible. Th that period of time, I won't call the tribulation because that's a misused term. The tribulation is the last half of that seven year, not the seven years, it's the last half. So the more scholarly, accurate term is called the 70th week of Daniel. Gabriel gave Daniel 70 weeks of prophecy, and the last one is still unfulfilled. It's the 70th week that it's all about. So uh, what we're going to do next time, for the next session, I want you to read Daniel 9, and I want you to outline the last four verses of that chapter, Daniel 9, through, uh, 9 24 through 27. It's, if you understand that passage, all prophecy, Old and New Testament, will start to fall into place. When four disciples came to Jesus for a private briefing on His second coming, He pointed them to that passage to, under, to unravel it all. So before we get into chapter 6, we want to deal with some essential background. And um, so this is essential background in understanding the last days. And so um, with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank You for Your precious Word. We thank You that You brought us here tonight. We pray, Father, that You would just illuminate that path before each of us as we hunger to know Your will in our lives. Father, we pray that You would reignite in each of us a new hunger, a new awareness of Your Word. Help us to understand the extremes You've gone to on our behalf. We also pray, Father, that You would just help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior that we might each be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities you put before us. As we commit ourselves this evening into your hands,
without any reservation, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen.